This is part two of our conversation that was really inspired by um, our essays in the amazing anthology Teaching Resistance, um, edited by John Mink, um, who is also, you can't see him, but he's definitely back there helping us out um, and moderating for us today. Um, we, so yeah, we, uh, we sort of started talking about, we talked a little bit about our essays, but really uh, y'all should buy that book. Um, none of the authors uh, in the book actually get paid. Um, pretty much all royalties. At, so that means like after printing costs and all that, uh, go to Teachers for Social Justice. Um, but, you know, go ahead and get the book. It's great. And <laughs> what we're going to do, uh, what, what we did was we talked a little bit about that. We talked um, more broadly about uh, issues surrounding education, um, the, the current social moment. Khadijah fell down. Um, and then, <laughs> um, what's really interesting too is uh, just to to um, to kind of put a final point on something that we were talking about uh, in the last hour is um, so I'm logged in to PM Press's page, and uh, if you go on to PM Press's page, what you will see is a beautiful Howard Zinn quote and the Wall of Moms which if you were just joining us last time, you'll be like, uh-huh. Um, so uh, we're going to do a couple of things. Uh, we are definitely going to talk more about policing, um, the state, and violence, because uh, we know that's what all y'all rebel rousers came here to do. But um, we, we were asked a couple of, we were asked to talk about a couple of things before that, um, including if uh, we could talk about the parallels of nonviolent communication and nonviolent protest, um, if we could talk about punishment versus consequences, which that's totally in my wheelhouse. That's your wheelhouse um, for sure. That's why I wanted us to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's so what I to read Melissa's <laughs> essay. That chapter changed my life. <laughs> Lies. It's true. <laughs> Nothing but truth. Um, so let's do this. Can I talk a little bit about punishment versus consequences? And then you could take um, parallels of nonviolent communication and nonviolent protest, and that can kind of feed into our next piece around policing and all and all and all that. Sounds good. Are you going to read any selections from your chapter? Because I am ready to you know read what's some selections. <laughs> You know chapter. what's so embarrassing about this whole thing? It's we're like, yeah, we're we're here talking about teaching, teaching resistance, and then so like I said, I am uh, currently in an undisclosed location in a cabin in the woods, and I didn't bring, I didn't bring my book. <laughs> <laughs> like I was all, oh, I should probably not. You know, my partner, for example, who I think is somewhere on here, um, is very well aware that, like, when I pack for anything, I always bring, like, 10 stacks of books. And I was like, you know what? I'm going somewhere. They're going to have books. I'm bringing my journal only. So, no, I didn't. I played my own self. Don't but worry. you know what that means? Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh. I will provide us with the goods. Don't you motherfucking worry. <laughs> so you go ahead. Let me let me choose um one selection out of my fifty noted selections. Y'all, too much. She's too much. Oh my goodness. Okay. I want to tackle <laughs> Eve. Eve is like, yes, yeah, so true. That's right. I see you. Um, I want to see is, yep, you guys are back. All right, great. I was making sure that the folks who talk, who asked about punishment versus consequences were on, and so Sweet. we go. Um, there are a couple of things. In our, in our last chat, um, and also, Khadija, you mentioned um, that, you know, there's essentially a stigma that's attached to kids who are uh, uh, a stigma that, that is attached to kids who are op too often disciplined. Um, and there, there's a lot of great emerging and accessible scholarship around the issue, right? Um, K, K. Wayne Yang does, writes an awesome, awesome uh, article about this. 
um, that I highly suggest you read, and I think that I might have actually noted it in that <laughs> book. Discipline okay. or punish, it's highlighted. Don't you worry. So I might have just added myself as a big nerd. It's cool. I'm embracing it. Basically, um, so, there, so discipline. Let's talk about it real fast. Discipline is literally taken from the Latin, which is to teach, right? So when we are disciplining, we're teaching. Um, it is possible to negatively discipline folks. And we see examples of that all the time. Um, but discipline at, on its face isn't necessarily negative, right? I mentioned before in the last hour, uh, John, uh, I talked about John Lewis and how he was a very disciplined, very principled practitioner of nonviolent protest, right? And he was disciplined in that he learned he, t he took it in. He was like, he, he was a student of nonviolent protest, right? Um, and th there are many, many examples of folks who are, who are students of these things that essentially makes you a disciple, right? Catholicism, Christianity um, have sort of taken the word disciple and twisted it, made it into something that is uh, both religiously coded um, and to that it's also morally coded. Um, and that also speaks to what Khadija was talking about before around, um, like morality being, being attached to our behaviors, right. In all these different ways. Um, so when we are, when we're disciplining folks, we are hopefully imparting knowledge, right. We're, we're hopefully teaching. We're hopefully learning. Um, this is, this is also a really key aspect of understanding restorative justice and restorative practices. It's not just about for, forgiving folks, and we can maybe talk about that later, but really is about um, collaborating, being in partnership, being authoritative versus authoritarian, right? So I'll hold there for a second and come back to punishment. Punishment really, really, really exists for one reason only. It is to coerce by negative means some type of desired behavior, right? Um, and a punishment is different from a consequence, right? Uh, for example, many of you were here when I just tripped over this little step stool here, right? Dun, 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 dun. I, <laughs> a natural consequence. <laughs> it is a natural consequence. And it's also a consequence of me walking around here with no shoes on, right? I, I tripped, I stubbed my toe, I got hurt. It's a natural consequence. Right. A consequence is literally the action that comes at the reaction that comes after an action. Um, and there like, we deal with consequences, millions of them every single day. Um, we conflate consequences and punishment. We conflate, conflate punishment and discipline. Um, so if I had a, a piece of white sticky paper here and some markers that I usually is when I'm training in person, um, I draw a triangle, and then I draw a whole bunch of arrows pointing to all these things. And so it's important to note, right, um, that sometimes, especially like as, as parents or caregivers of uh, younger folks who don't have all of their executive functioning in place, right, I'm assuming we all do, that was absurd, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we sometimes have to say, because I said so, go to bed because, be, you know what, we've already had the discussion because I said so. Right. Um, sometimes we have to say, mm, you were doing something ridiculous with your cell phone. Right. Let's say, you know, Khadija was bullying somebody on her cell phone. I'm going to take your cell phone away. It's a natural consequence. It's related to, to what happened. It's going to feel like punishment. And maybe it is a little bit. But the idea isn't to coerce better behavior. The idea is to actually teach you that when you bully somebody, there are all kinds of, of negative consequences that go along with that, right? And so I want to I wanna just pause there because I could really talk about this for 75 hours. Same. And I want to see, see if I answered that question uh, to the folks who asked it. And I definitely... I just want to add workshops on. in this. Just yeah, I just want to add on. Yeah. Uh, hire Melissa. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, you probably are not charging enough. Double your rate. Double your rate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, though, you know, for a lot of people, one 
I'm sure this maps into your life because this is the world we live in. But I also want to encourage you to think about, you know, when you step into adulthood and you're living in your own place for the first time or living with new people and like you break a glass, for example. I know if I broke a glass in my household, I'm getting in trouble, you know, because I must have been careless. I, mu I should have planned better all of these things. But in my house, when I break a glass, it's like, oh, shoot. I broke a glass. Let me clean this up. <laughs> That's the consequence. I have to clean this up. You know mm. what I mean? The consequence is not shaming me, making me feel horrible for not being, for not planning. It's not all my fault because this glass is broken, you know, even though I can plan better next time. Um, but it's not like it doesn't center around punishment and um, feeling bad for what you've done. Obviously, we, right. we do want people to be accountable and accountability is... But accountability comes from self, like I've said before. Like, it is not about other people holding you accountable. This is like a frequent topic right now. People are always like, we need to hold police accountable. It's like, actually, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that needs to come from them. They need to recognize that they stepped into a system that is predicated on the suffering of people and the protection of the state's property. Like of all my jobs as a black woman. <laughs> holding police accountable is not one of them yeah i'm not doing that i mean obviously I, it's easy it's a fun catchphrase for me to say that accountability comes from self but there is times when the community is responsible slash can aid people in meeting those right. goals but they need to have that own willingness on their own so did the folks respond and say if uh you yes. answered that question dope yeah sweet 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 so <clears throat> I mean, I just have a quick selection from page 15 of the book. <laughs> um, it's from someone that is dear to me, someone I think is brilliant, someone you all <laughs> may know of, who, who may, be, may or may not be already on this live stream. Um, Too much. <laughs> but they say, um, that you're quoting um, from Kay Wayne Yang here, which is what you were just talking about. And you said... Um, Yang writes, furthermore, this racial disproportionate punishment and preference is not invisible to our students. They are collectively impacted by the culture of removal, even if they themselves are not punished. This is kind of what the comment from Alessia was talking about, about students noticing the othering of other students. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, are not punished. So-called zero tolerance policies negatively impact everybody as even students who don't fit the demographic profile for punishment see themselves as always being available for punishment. More damningly, however, these students begin to believe that some are more deserving of punishment than others. This reinforces and perpetuates the cycle of exclusion as all students grow into adults who are conditioned to believe that black people are more deserving of punishment. Some of these students grow up to be teachers, principals, store clerks, cops, and judges. So I think that that's a perfect segue into our talks about policing. Wait, did I answer my question? <laughs> Was I Around answer a question first? The parallels of nonviolent communication and nonviolent protest, which I think you can get to. I think you can get to. For, starting from that question, I would say that nonviolent communication asks us to be content with being misunderstood, which means um, we need to be okay with other people living and um, living in the, in, in a different reality from ours, experiencing the world in a different reality from ours. And I think that that connects to nonviolent tactics because in the training to do a non violent like protests some that i'm sure john lewis and other people involved in SNCC and other things um were accustomed to these trainings where people are spitting at you and throwing things at you and you have to remain disciplined and in your practice of nonviolence. um and i think that this is kind of the closest parallel i can draw to those things because that is you being okay with these other people um experiencing a situation where you are wrong and and worthy of punishment um and that is not your reality and you're there for an entirely different purpose um i think where these things diverge 
is that nonviolent communication is a tactic to communicate, to do other things that are revolutionary and nonviolent and nonviolent, uh, protesting tactics stop you there because at a certain point you do need to convince these people not to be beating you, you know? And so that's, there's a divergence there because mm -hmm. in nonviolent communication, you are not trying to convince people of another reality, but rather change their behavior. Actually, I guess those are still, they still converge there because you yeah. don't, they don't need to believe that you're human. They just need to respect you pretty much. And they do converge in hearts and minds, right? Like they do. One, one nonviolent protest literally asks you to utilize your body, right, in order to secure, to secure rights or to secure understanding. Where nonviolent communication um, really is is really asking you to. It's it's much more of a, It's interestingly much more of an active thing right because you're you're literally um it's asking you to not communicate aggressively it's asking you to communicate thoughtfully um from the heart assertively right um but without aggression and so so it's it's interesting that in those two actions one is actually more active yeah if that makes sense i mean not doing anything is an action and a great one so i i don't know i think that language is failing us a bit here <laughs> because um, not like n not like sitting and not doing something is something so that is still active also because if somebody snap. spits in, somebody spits in your face you're gonna want to react i'm just saying period point blank there's no mm -hmm. like that takes training but yeah totally so let's talk about police let's go you know i've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and itching and itching oh. to get started oh, on this oh i know so as someone mentioned when they said they're calling i mean they're listening in from boston boston, hey. has, boston has the first like kind of official police force um and before that in 1704 i'm um, in the carolinas the slave patrols are really popping off and that spreads across the south of course because there's a huge <laughs> enslaved people popul en enslaved population um, but in Boston, they have the first police force, which is organized to control shipping things and to protect the property of these rich owners, like these warehouse owners and stuff, and also sex workers. And so this is, this is some history that's new to me and I just learned about, but basically these kind of voluntary patrols that most people actually didn't want to be a part of because communities reject people coming around to police them. Like maybe now people have seen so much propaganda, so many shows about how we need the police, so many um, messages about policing being even partially helpful sometimes, you know, um, that they don't feel as resistant immediately. But when policing was first coming out, people are like, fuck this shit. We don't even, we don't want people to be a part of this. We don't want to be associated with it. And they didn't want to wear badges because people hated them so fucking much, you know? And that's back to trusting your gut. When you trust your gut, <laughs> you don't end up with hundreds of years of policing, period. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> they are <laughs> like, the Damn. Police, they didn't even fuck with themselves. <laughs> so... <laughs> And you have to remember, like I was talking about earlier, the state kind of takes ownership of women's bodies uh, and decides that they're for producing more laborers for them and more subjects. Mm. And so sex, mm. like policing sex workers' bodies is a part of property interests, in my p opinion. And that's an opinion. Um, that's not necessarily what they set out in their mission. But I do believe that um, the, like... Being anti-sex worker is being pro-police. That's just, sorry, but there it is. There it fucking is. So that's like the foundations of the Boston police and the, the, just policing in general. So we're talking about property in women's bodies and also in um, like shipping companies and stuff. And this brings me to Anarchy Works for a second because we are talking about 
citizens being asked to pay for the service that they don't even want. We're also talking about provide, like we're asking for them to pay to protect rich people's shit and what rich people think they own in sex workers' bodies. And um, this is all super relevant because when we're talking about crime, which at the time there was no increasing crime, you know, the, the policing thing comes up just to protect this property. When we're, the crime was that we wanted to run away from plantations and shit. That was period. the crime. Exactly. And that's not they even crime. gave it a name. They, they, they gave it a psychological condition wanting to run away. Oh, shit. She had to fall over because it's Sorry. so real. <laughs> it's so powerful. <laughs> it's so, she was like, I'm out this chair. <laughs> but there was, there, there was a psychological condition named for wanting to run away from a plantation. All right. Yeah, I'm Keep so going. Glad, no, that's important to know. It really is. So <clears throat> all I'm saying is, <laughs> not all I'm saying, I'm going to say many mm -mm. things. I'm going to say many things. <laughs> but, you know, when we're talking about crime, like the initial thing that was a crime is, number one, wanting to police people at all and wanting us to pay for rich people's fucking secu private security shit. And to that's this right. day, <clears throat> from... Anarchy works in the section called crime under the who will protect us without police. This is an excellent um, book for those of you just learning about anarchy and those of you who have already been anarchists. This is literally a handbook to tell liberals, shut the fuck up. Here's what's going on. <laughs> I mean, every single, every single section, the crime section is who will protect us without police. What about gangs and bullies? Who, what's to stop someone from killing people? What about rape, domestic violence, and other forms of social harm? And all of this is based in lots of history about the way people have done things before capitalism took over, before, you know, <clears throat> yeah, it's just, it's excellent. And it's very historical. And it talks about a lot about indigenous peoples, about black and brown communities, about communities outside of the United States. It's excellent. And so what they start talking about is, like, if we're so concerned about crime, why are we not worried about all of these massive war like warehouse owners and other employers um, who are abusing the workers and abusing so many people? You know, we care about crime if it's gun violence or whatever, but we don't care about, you know, warehouse owners not making sure there's uh, water, break time, etc. Cough, cough, nudge, nudge, Jeff Be Bezos, but not just him. You know, we're talking mm -hmm. about all of these fucking um, ruling class motherfuckers who don't care about people and are never talked about as criminals. And so in, he in note 71, it says, in 2005, 5,734 workers were killed by traumatic injury on the job and an estimated 50,000 to 60,000 died from occupational diseases. Um, and they're bringing this up because of all the killings of workers by employer negligence between 1982 and 2002, fewer than 2,000 were investigated by the government. And of those, only 81 resulted in convictions and only 16 resulted in jail time. And of course, this is not to say our vision of justice is, you know, within the state's imagination, which is prisons as of now. It's just to say that we're, if we were so concerned with crime, niggas would be focused on that. But they aren't, you know, because it's not about crime and it's not about protecting people. And further, <clears throat> if, I, <laughs> if I may. <laughs> Open your hymnals, children. Many more people may be killed by pollution and work-related accidents than by drugs, but drug dealers are branded as a threat to society, not factory owners. And even when factory owners break the law in a way that kills people, they are not sent to prison. So this is, this is so fucking relevant. Um, I do hope that y'all pick up that book and our book um, because, wait, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? Oh, because what was I going to say? I ooh, ooh, what, what was I just talking about, Melissa? Please, I'm putting me. it in. Look, you're making broad connections here between. There's, I want to tie it all together for y'all. But to, and and here's the thing: I think that that you you went so fast and so far that you actually already tied it together, oh. right? You're t yes, it's called Anarchy Works, it, and you are talking about how the condition of 
people being property, right? Police existing to protect property, police existing to protect rich people's property, right? Um, and how all of that can, connects to how in this current moment of policing, right? Police, police aren't actually, they're not here. They're not here to protect you, to protect me. They're not here to deal with 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 crime, right? With the specter the, of crime. The, 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 and, and that's the point, right? The point is that literally the police have, they've always been an arm of the state and they've always existed to pr protect the interests of the very rich and the very powerful. And so when people start talking about, um, like we're starting to have conversations, again, that common parlance, which is like both a, a blessing and a curse of folks talking about, um, you know, defund the police. It's, it's real now. We're going to defund the, the police. And, 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 but what we should do is we should hire social workers as though, and again, I, I apologize to all my social worker homies out there, but as though social work isn't also a form of policing. Um, as though uh, mental health facilities to are and to an extent um, kind of like are another arm of imprisonment of confinement, um, and that really you know that that proper like and so some oh wow that's weird somebody just here said what I was just about to say that property owners are constantly harming community with impunity and that's real the fact that the fact that that police can continue to impose harm in communities. The social workers can continue to, to harm communities, actual communities, families, right? Um, and that that goes un, unanswered, untalked about, where I was talking about the, the, the crime of the other. Um, oh, right? I remember. There it is. So I was going to start talking about how uh, propaganda and also just like our ideas of police being about protection um, are a big like shield from the reality that police have morphed into the only like into the people who have a stronghold on like legitimate violence and uh, the use of legitimate force um, and as like the like the direct connection to state violence like for your average person their only connection to state violence is the police or social workers or like you know those kind of services um and one of the big issues with this is like even if you wanted to go outside and have a fist fight with somebody like that's illegal and so now this is important why i said what i said about legitimate use of force is because we are not outnumbered by the police or the military. There are more people than there are police officers and military people. But we have been conditioned, slashed, beaten, and punished for asserting our rights to using force um, outside of these legitimate means. Um, and so the major connection here is when police are the pretty much sole actors of the state and have a monopoly on the use of force it keeps people from rebelling it keeps people from asserting their rights and um it's also what's keeping us from revolution because the major negotiating point is not you know how many nonviolent protests will we have before they realize or how many buildings will we burn down but rather i'm kind of nervous to say this <laughs> But like, when are we going to start shooting cops? Because, you know, hypothetically speaking, hypothetically speaking, in a rhetorical sense, because, utilizing semantics, <laughs> we should sometimes ask the question, go, when are we shooting cops? Because out of, like we we must before we can get to the point of negotiating with people before we can get to like before we can even reach this moment of you know let's sit down and decide you know what black people need see what they want blah blah, blah. like we're not even at a negotiating point because they have a stronghold on the use of force and if we violate that then we get in trouble 
And so they're always able to use that against us. And that completely ruins like the seeds of revolution that we need. Does that make sense? That's right. Oh, that's like, a word. It's, an, it's a super important big ask because until we, until they're afraid that something is going to happen to them the way that we are, there is no negotiating. You know what I mean? Like we, we can't, yes, we, and. we can't even get to the point of negotiating because there yes, is. And. I'm going to push back. Okay. I'm going to push back just a little bit. Push back. All right. So I'm a little bit of a free errand, right? And uh, I have come to believe that I don't necessarily want to do the same shit to the people who have oppressed me that they've been doing to oppress me all my life, right? And I'm not saying that, that that's what you're saying. But it is one of the main reasons why I find um, restorative practices to be so compelling, and it is because it really, 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 like at its core, right, restorative practices does what? It focuses on relationships. It focuses on the fact that we're all in relationship with something, with someone, with each other, no matter, no matter whether or not we want to be, right? Um, and the focus on relationships requires that we actually, that we actively think about what does the world look like when we're not out trying to get each other all the time. Right. What is what does the world look like when and, and I'm not I'm not saying this to be like super kumbaya y right? Because as I said at the at the top of last time, I'm not a pacifist and I totally believe in defense, self defense and protection. One thousand billion percent. I also believe at a certain point we have to act actively cut these these aspects of policing and surveillance out of our lives. And the, the very fact that there, that there are whole armies that aren't as big as we are as people, but are, you know, definitely better armed out there ready at a moment's notice to shoot us dead or beat our asses tells me that we could either try to get as big and giant as they are, or we can try to essentially mm, disconnect from them. We could try both and or all of it. Right. Because much like you, I 100 percent believe in spectral thinking and non-binary non thinking. And I think that it's important, though, that we like that we get we, we actually interrupt this this notion that I need to get anything from these people at this point. What I need to do is get extricated from them. Right. I need to get free of them. I don't need to get free from them. I don't I, I don't need them to hand me freedom. Right. Because they ain't going to do that shit. And I already know that. And you already know that. Like, we're black people. They're not going to give us nothing. And we don't want and them to give us And how to disconnect anyway. was like... Like, because right? what they're willing to give us is nothing that we want anyway. Right. And so, two people just act, ask back to back, how do we disconnect? And I love this question because, like, it, like it's a little tiny badminton racket in the movie Get Out. I'm going to bat it right back to you. How else could we disconnect from this? How, like, what are some other ways, alternate ways? Well, we're already doing them. We're collective living. We're growing our own food. We are doing community things. We're mutual. We're doing mutual aid. I want to hear from y'all out there. Yeah, me too. There's at least 45 of you. And How I, are you disconnecting? I'm not, while y'all are typing that, I want to say, you know, you bring forth a really important point. And I don't want what I said earlier to be misconstrued. I'm saying that as things, as a, like, as citizens, we're required no matter what. I mean, even if we don't do it, but we're required when things escalate to physical violence with the exception of hitting children, which is out of pocket, you know, but Go. when physical, like, uh, escalate to physical violence and we as citizens are required to call the police. So if we, like, because they have the stronghold on legitimate force. So if the people the entire United States or any people abroad, et cetera, decided to turn on the state, we could win, you know, um, based on the numbers. I don't know, actually, based on the tactics, but we'll see. But that brings forth what you said, you know, who do we want to be when the revolution ends? And I, you, and, and it doesn't end because it's a process. It's not, it's mm. not a moment. But what I'm saying here is, you know, you've brought forth that kind of thought, you know, 
I'm not interested in revenge. And I'm not, I'm not really interested in revenge, though I'm not mad at the people who are. I'm not mad at the people who are, want revenge for the hundreds of years of um, murder, rape, just horrible atrocities to their to our people and to mm. other poor people etc like i am not mad at them for wanting re revenge but that's not where i'm coming from you know i want to use all my energy towards building something for our people you know what i mean and so that that does come into this question um and so because as a as a young person, like high school age writing, I constantly thought, you know, who do we want to be when the revolution ends? Because it's very easy to say, let's just kill these people. You know, it's much harder to consider, you know, what it means for everyday people to go from having to murder their oppressors to, you know, trying to do restorative practice in circles every day now, you know, after a violent revolution. And what will that do to our people? What kind of mindset will they be in? Where will they be? You know, right. um, but that does like, it doesn't mean never. It just means these are many things to consider. And that's what you're leaning into. Hate to say leaning in. That's what you're leaning into. That's what you're, you know, diving bravely into when saying like, it's not about binaries. It doesn't mean no violence. It just means tactical violence, you know? Um, and that's so important. I'm seeing some stuff in the chat. I want to read out. You just, first of all, you just caught a full FBI jacket. Congratulations. And you just said so, so many different, like all, like, all of the things. I wish that we had three more hours to talk about this. Me too. Honestly, I mean, it's something that I consider all the time. And it's hard for me to get far in it because it's just hard. That's why I read theory, because it energizes me. <laughs> so what I see, I see <laughs> developing... A, of alternatives to the system that is based on oppression and extraction is a goal I would love to see, but it's also a tall order. And I'm still, what I'm hearing there is, you know, uh, we want to develop alternatives, but that's our question here. You know, what are those alternatives? How do we, and one of the most power, powerful things I read as a young person that brought me to my perspectives now is how much we need radical imagination. And I read that in Killing King Abacus. I hope that y'all could check that out. It's about societies without measure, which is obviously fundamentally anarchist. And it's incredible because um, it really helped me remember that like, I don't have to, well, it showed me, it showed me anarchy in a way that I hadn't seen it at that time because my, my, it showed me, the beauty, the kindness, the be like the dream of anarchy. And that's not to say, you know, that it doesn't have to have some violence attached, you know? And it's also and not, it's not an appeal as like, oh no, we're actually good. We're actually nice. That's not my point here. You know, like my yeah. point is not that we're dreamers and that that should be our mainstream appeal. You know, that we're actually the good guys. That's not the point. My point is just that it's okay for us to be, um, discussing and thinking about these really dismal, horrible things, but also remembering to like intertwine some dreaming because it's that creativity that wins movements. And can I, can I say a word? Can I say a word? I'm going to tie it into a comment that Vicky Velcro said, said, by the way, Vicky, hi, I love you. It's nice to see you. Shout out Boston. You're like the only good person in Boston. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Vicky says limiting participation when feasible in the systems we don't want to model, not giving it power, right? So that, that's like, that's a whole thing. But I wanted to say something, and this is around like this idea of imagination um, and, and, and around these ideas, these questions, right, that, that often, I mean, as, as a restorative justice practitioner, I always get the like, but what about the rapists and murderers, which we could talk about another time. This is which not the forum you for can, that. You can read the essay that answers that question right. with historical evidence about what we've done. Right. And... And I want to, I just want to note something that's so important and, and that what we often forget, right? So we're in the time of COVID. We're in the time of another giant, giant, like social revolution. Don't underestimate what's happening out here. We're also living in the time of Hamilton. And y'all, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about it, but I am going to mention 
Now, one of the things that people are always talking about when they're talking about how amazing America is and all the, you know, the what founding kind of fathers. Are you fucking Wait, following? just hold on. Hold on. You know what the fuck I'm talking about, right? It's like America so great and America was founded on these ideals and blah, 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 blah. What do you think those motherfuckers were doing when they were sitting out there? You know, like slaughtering people and enslaving folks and writing lofty ass, long ass preambles and shit on a damn Torah scroll, being all we hold these truths to be self evident. Like they were imagining shit. This shit, why would no like fake ass logic? We can talk about how logic is stupid another time. But it was, it wasn't that right. They were imagining their way out of their own fake oppression. Right. <laughs> we can actually imagine our way out of our own oppression and we can do so by utilizing the tools that we already have. Which are, are come on. Connecting with ourselves and, com and and coming together as community. I love to say community. Honestly, I'm sure there's like a tally, a running tally of me saying community, <laughs> community, community. But yeah. Like, someone cut that together in a video. Don't do that. But, <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, that is part of it. Like, they're able to imagine what they want for themselves and their countrymen. That's what they say. But, like, that's what we can do. We are allowed to do that. We can do that. And by tapping into what our needs are, you know, we can build yeah. that society. That reminds me of a Rick and Morty episode, the Purge uh -uh. episode. You no, it? reel it in. No, it fine, in. fine, fine. Anyway, anyway, reel it anyway in. I'll tell y'all another time. <laughs> so anyway, I was just going to read this quote. It says, um, human needs are dynamic, which I absolutely believe. You know, our, our needs change from time to time. We have some basic core needs, but it's not always the same for every situation. And the state and state justice is the execution of universal prescriptions codified into law. And that's the kind of thing that we need to resist. Like this idea of um, a one size fits all approach to something, something that is not uh, all the gray areas. You know, that's what we need. We, let me try to say this in a perfect sound bite. It is essential to the survival of our movement and the life and future of our people to recognize the complexities of the human experience and focus on creating a place for people to be alive, like people to live, people to, people to, people to be a part of a community, a community. <laughs> but I can't say anything after you. But I'm just saying, but you know, real. like, for real, like, we, that is our work. Our work is to do there. Will this require genuine place slash land-based communities? Now, that is a hard question because, you know, um, I could have started this with the land acknowledgement. Um, you, like, we... Does, it's never too late. Does community start... Well, this is a lonely land. Thank you. Um, but then my next thing is, like, will, will this require genuine place? You know, it's tough. It's tough. We don't need to think of communities as a physical place. Like I talked about earlier with Imagine Communities, which is actually, there's a book called Imagine Communities. It's decent. Um, but it does help kind of, uh, like, that's not my top recommendation off this chat. But it does help us focus this idea of, you know, what, ev what does it mean to be a part of a community? And what does it mean for that community to stretch across the globe? You know? Mm -hmm. And it helped me kind of think of blackness um, as a global identity and not limited mm. to a specific place and not limit blackness to like my grandma's house, you know, like not like not to put it in one specific place. And so I don't know. It's up to us. That's the other thing. Like it gets like it gets really convoluted thinking of theory sometimes and thinking of it as like, oh, well, we need to follow these rules because what about, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? You know, mm -hmm. but like all of this shit is made up. We are making all of this shit up as we go along and that's allowed. And we can look towards some of the history of how our people, when I'm saying our people, I'm talking about anarchists of the past, you know, like 
and people who don't even consider themselves anarchists, people who are not thinking them thinking of themselves as anarchists, but people who are building these autonomous spaces inside of the state. A lot of the things they're talking about in this Anarchy Works book, a lot of the uh, past like organizations and like different types of societies are happening while they're still within the control technically of a state. Um, so look, the Esalen tribe just bought like, I don't even know how many thousands of acres back from the government in Big Sur right now, right? Like they just, they were like, okay, United States, like you basically don't, you don't adhere to anything that you say you're going to do, but you listen to money. So here's some money. And they literally bought that shit. Yeah. Like today. Um, oh, wow. Speaking of land acknowledgements, right? It's a big deal. It is a big deal. Um, and I think... I, I think to piggyback on, on what you're saying, um, that, yeah, like, it, it's up to us, right? It, it, and it doesn't mean, like, when, when we're sitting here and we're talking on Instagram Live at, you know, 6 p.m. Pacific time, we're not sitting here saying, like, oh, we got it figured out. We did it. We're like, we, all, we did it, now you do it. That's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is we have to do this together. And it means that we're going to fall down and we have to be there to pick each other up. It means that we're going to fuck up. Right. And it means that like, like we're, we're actually talking about this stuff, like, like the, the shifting of the mind also known as a paradigm shift, right? We're actively talking about this as another strategy to use to, to, and, and we're, we're encouraging one another to be brave and like to, to legitimately be brave and be like, okay, this might not work. Right. I had somebody was uh, up on the Facebook last week and they were like, yo, Hive, uh, my neighbor has been freaking out for like an hour or two or three or whatever. Um, I don't want to call the cops. What should I do? That mere moment was everything because all sorts of people were like, hey, try this, try this, try this, try this in in all of those. Try this that, you know, she asked for those things. Right. There were like 15 different options. None of them included calling the cops, right? Some of them were more hands-on. Some of them were more like call this person or do this or that. But that, that's, that's what we're talking, talking about. That's what we're advocating for here, right? Absolutely. And I think also think about what we already do when we need mm -hmm. something. You know, you need to get to the doctor if you have health care. Oh, a mess. You need you you know, like you need to get to the doctor. Who do you call? Your yeah. like your friends, your community, your community, your family, your 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 network is who you reach out to. And then of course the question becomes like what if you have no web network? But if you're a part of this autonomous zone, then you do have a network. You know? Um right. it's like we all we already do take care of each other. We have frequently been conditioned to think that we're all about the individual. We only care about us, but that's actually not true. People love to take care of other people. People love to do things for people. And you'll notice it in just how you feel when you collaborate. And yes, right. collaborative efforts and organization are beautiful and they're all over the place. You know what I mean? Like people don't actually need to know the theory to know about mutual aid. They do it. But theory it, it, that doesn't mean don't read it. I love Siri. It's very important to me. And I think that both of those things go hand in hand because yeah. learned experience and lived experience are one thing and they are valuable to us, but they, they need to be combined with also theory. And I mean, in terms of meeting people, meeting the material needs of people who are attempting to distance themselves from systems of oppression. I mean, meeting people is that a phone call M meeting people is like is is our idea of meeting people only in person and this is something we've all started to think about as covid rages on you know but you know what but but here's something and i do i do recognize that uh that we told y'all we were going to end at six oh, well, so we'll we got probably wrap 12. up we're gonna wrap up no you're right you're right but i'm i'm just noting we're we're gonna reel it in a little bit um but when I'm reading this, right, right, I mean, in terms of meeting the material needs of people who are attempting to distance themselves from systems of oppression, um, I think that, again, this is, this is a place, and you'll hear this about as, as, as much as you hear Khadija say community, you will hear me say this. 
Um, a, we have to be imaginative. B, we, we, this, this by no stretch are we re recommending that you immediately extricate yourself from the capitalist economy. That's foolish and you can't do it, right? Um, but are there ways in which we can kind of hustle around this stuff, right? I'm thinking about, um, like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big endorser of the whole entire um, nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. But, um, but I do recognize that there are times when nonprofits can actually do meaningful work. Um, I don't just say that because I work part-time for a nonprofit. Um, I do that. Be I, I say this because I know, like, I'm thinking of one right now, right? Free from dot org. Um, on their face, you know, they're respectable. Uh, but do you know what they do? Like, they, they legitimately give folks who are leaving domestic violence situations resources, give them seed money to start their own businesses, right? And help them help them get financially free from the people or the persons who are abusing them, right? So in this way, even though they're a nonprofit and we can have all kinds of different analysis about nonprofits, right? And in the Bay Area, we're so privileged to have these hyper uh, critical analysis. I just want to I just want to put it out there. Like if you ever been in the Southeast, you might have a different analysis of particular nonprofits. But this, you know, like this one, and this is this is one of, of thousands of hundreds of thousands, right? If we can connect each other to these things, right? Somebody connected me to a nonprofit that has me being able to rest and recuperate in the woods in a location I ain't telling any all about. But you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like I'm not again. I'm not speaking to a binary, this is the answer, here's how we answer it, right? I'm not speaking to this so-called black and white thinking. I'm speaking to there are options and there are ways in which we can get to what we need. And oftentimes that requires, and I'm saying this as much to myself as I'm saying this to anybody else, oftentimes that means asking for help, right? In this country, if you, particularly if you're born and raised in this country, you are taught not to ask for help. You are taught that if you don't do nothing, every single thing on your own, then you're worthless. And we have to undo that thinking, right? There's so many different ways, so many different things that we have to really, really um, acknowledge in ourselves and acknowledge in the people around us, right? Take it away, homie. So thank you for calling on me. I have something to say. <laughs> that's actually, that's, a, that's, that's an inside joke. Anyway, I have something to say. So um, one thing that I immediately thought of when you're talking about free form and talking about them, like empowering women and people to um, like start their own businesses is one of those capitalist traps I hate where like we have to give people money for a specific thing, um, which that's not, that's no shade on freeform. It's just, I also want to talk about, you know, that we, as a, as a human society and as like in the past, there have been instances where people just provide people with what they need. Like this idea that money mm -hmm. has been around forever and that, uh, trade direct trade has all like in barter systems have been like the go-to is actually not true there's a book about it called debt i'll also put that in the chat <laughs> but it's, it's all about like you know giving people what they need and so that everyone has what they need so it's like you need i make shoes you need shoes i give you shoes maybe one day down the line i need some soup and you have soup and you give it to me maybe not but the fact of the matter is, you know, we take, up, we take care of our people. You need something, you receive it. And it's not about that value of that item. It's not about calculating the value of that item to create debt in the future. It's literally just about meeting people's needs. Um, and so one thing that people get caught up in, in capitalist societies and just in general, like as a thought project is like, okay, well, if I give someone money, like I want to see some returns, basically, you know, like this money is for this thing. A lot of people talk about not giving homeless people money because they don't want them to spend it on drugs. That's fucking ridiculous. Mm. Spend your I talk about this all the time. Spend talk the about money this all the time. on whatever the fuck you want to spend it on because it's supposed to be a gift. 
that, that's it. Yeah. It's not, it's not yours to control after that. And so many people just need money. You know what I mean? They don't need, yeah. they don't need a class on financial literacy. <laughs> they just need more money. They don't have enough. Yeah. Um, yes, community, get with the program. Thank you for saying that. Thank you, everyone, for putting up with my obnoxious community uh, chant. But, it, you know, but that's what it's about. You know, uh, it's, yeah. it's about building those spaces where we freely give things to people. That's what mutual aid is. Um, and it's not about creating a debt spiral. Ridiculous, ridiculous. Right. And so I see that we're running right. out of time. Is that, is that a good end note? Do we need one more? Should we have final notes? Um, I'm going to read this. Capitalism creates a scarcity mentality, which gets talked about like a human characteristic, but it's not. Ooh, I'm going to bookmark that because we, we're going to talk about this. We got um, Paul says, Paul, oh, damn it. Sorry. <laughs> Paul says, Paul's recommending Seen on Radio for some light on, oh my God. <laughs> I, I keep, yeah, for some light on American democracy, whiteness, and patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Yum. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, Khadija is going to uh, put together a little bibliography for you all. <laughs> a little like excited that? for y'all. For that, Do you like that? So work side. It's, uh, one, we have one minute, one minute and 46 seconds remaining. So my closing note is the last chapter title of Anarchy Works, something that I've been thinking of a long time, but especially now, which is it'll work when we make it work. Mm. Um, and that is just pretty much a rallying cry. It's, it's not like as much as we do want to think about the future and work through these thought projects, Honestly, at the end of the day, this will work. This society we want to build slash this autonomous zone we want to build slash this place free of oppression and harm and shittiness that we want mm -hmm. will work when we make it work. You know, and that's for us. That is our homework. And that's something I'll accept. That's a natural consequence I'll accept. The, the work and labor that it takes to make that thought project become a reality for us and our posterity, I guess. But I don't really want to have kids. I'm morally opposed. Anyway. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have 38 seconds. What's your final? Well, my final is this. Um, really, I just want to thank all of you for uh, making this fun, uh, for bringing this live. I always want to thank Khadija for just being Khadija. Because, good Lord, y'all. I mean, you got like a fraction of how brilliant, right? Um, and, you know, I want to say it in the parlance that uh, betrays my age, that we should keep loving and keep fighting. We should fight the power all day, every day. 